Good morning. It is my privilege to welcome you to worship as we gather together today in the name of the risen Christ. However you are here with us, we are glad you are indeed worshiping with us today. For those of you who are with us in the room, we'd invite you to find the red folders in your pews that have our attendance pads. If you would, please sign your name to those and pass them around so that we might know who's joined us for worship today. For those of you who are worshiping with us online, we're glad you are here as well. And if you'd be willing to do so, we'd invite you to visit our website, firstumcgelsberg.org, uh, where there's a place for you to register your virtual attendance and let us know you are here as well. As we enter into worship today, I have a couple of announcements to share with the congregation. Uh, first of all, if you are in the room, there is an insert in your bulletin about uh, our events coming up next weekend. Uh, we are celebrating our 175th anniversary as a congregation, and uh, our first anniversary event is coming up uh, this coming weekend. And we have two things going on that weekend. First, on Saturday, we have a block party for uh, not just our congregation, but all of the community. Uh, we're planning to have uh, inflatables and a dunk tank and games out on the church lawn. Uh, we'll have free pizza and popcorn throughout the afternoon, and also a variety of musical entertainment will be happening. Uh, that's going to be from noon to four next Saturday. Uh, if there is uh, really bad weather, we may push it back until the ne next day, Sunday afternoon, but we're planning to be there um, on Saturday the 14th. Uh, on the 15th, we are planning just one worship service next weekend at 1030. Uh, that's going to be an outdoor tent meeting worship service uh, like the early Methodists would have had in the 1840s when our church was um, founded. And so we will have uh, some old time hymns. Uh, those of us who are leading the worship service will be in period dress and uh, we're just going to enjoy an outdoor tent meeting service. Um, which will be our only service. So for those of you who are used to worshiping with us at 9 o'clock, please make note of that change uh, for next Sunday. We'd love to have you with us for those two events next weekend and for you to invite all of your friends, neighbors, family members, and everybody else to come and celebrate with us. Uh, we are still in need of a few uh, volunteers to help with that. Uh, we could use uh, some uh, help setting up both days, um, Saturday and Sunday. Uh, on Saturday, we could use some uh, volunteers to help uh, pop and give out popcorn. Uh, we could also use some volunteers on Saturday to help us uh, monitor the inflatables and uh, make sure everybody is uh, having a good time and getting along. Uh, so if you're with us today, there are some sign-up sheets for uh, those volunteer slots uh, at the table in the back of the sanctuary. We'd love to have some help, uh, but most especially we would just uh, really enjoy having you with us uh, for those events next weekend. Today is uh, not just a, a, a Sunday, it is also Mother's Day in our culture, and so we want to make sure that we show appreciation to um, all of the mothers who are with us and who have done so much to uh, bless us in our lives. If you are a, a mother, a grandmother, a surrogate mother, we thank you, we appreciate you, and we love you. And I'd invite you to take a look at this uh, video to help us celebrate all of you. You don't have to wash your hands. I have so much time to myself. Hey, walk away when I'm talking to you. My kids really respect my privacy. When this timer goes off, please turn it off and do not tell me. Thanks. Here, can you use up all my battery? Don't call me when you get there. I don't want to know where you are. It is just too quiet in this car. Okay, we're about to leave for church, so if you're going to make a huge mess, you better do it now. I don't know. Your dad usually does everything around here. All of these people are such good drivers. Eating dinner is completely optional. Hanging up your towel is completely optional. Flushing the toilet is completely optional. Okay, this time, can you smile more like a crazy lunatic? 
Hey, you wanna dig through the fridge for the fifth time today? I'd definitely rather be here than at the beach. I am loving the look of these chips on the floor. I am loving the smell of your feet in my face. I am loving this back pain. Get a massage, ew, no thanks. Take anything you want from my closet and don't worry about putting it back. Don't look at the camera, look over there. If your sister takes your toy, just give her a good smack on the head. Hey, come drink that grape juice in here on the carpet. It's dinner time, everybody come get a snack. Hey, did you know you can wear the same pair of underwear all week long? of uh, our mothers and those who have showed us love and appreciation and we are sorry for all of the times that we are imperfect and we appreciate all that you do. As a way of continuing to honor and cherish the mothers around us, would you join with me in our Mother's Day prayer that is uh, in your bulletin or on our screens? Would you pray with me? Almighty God, we give you thanks for those mothers in our midst today, those who gave birth this year to their first child, those who are in the trenches with little ones every day, those living through driving tests, medical tests, and the overall testing of motherhood, and those who lavish attention and affection upon their grandchildren. We thank you also for those loving women who play important roles in all of our lives as foster moms, stepmothers, mentor moms, and spiritual moms. We pray for those mothers who have lost a child, for those who have experienced loss through miscarriage, failed adoption, or running away, and for those children who have lost their mothers this year. We thank you, O oh God, for the special relationships of mothers today. <coughs> Amen. Would you stand as you're able as we enter into worship today by praising the God who has loved us like no mother could.
Scripture tells us that Jesus was part of God and lived with God in the heavenly realms, yet did not consider equality with God something to be clung to and held on to, but emptied himself to come into this world to show us the love of God. And so as we think about how much uh, God has loved us in Jesus Christ and how much that majesty has been revealed to us through Jesus, let us continue to celebrate and worship that God who has blessed us and loved us so much.
Please be seated. Earlier this week, I was one of the members of our conference's Board of Ordained Ministry that was present at the Ordinance Day with the Bishop, where our uh, pastors who will be commissioned as provisional elders in our conference and uh, ordained as pastors in our conference were able to gather with our bishop. And I am proud to let you know that 20% of the new pastors at that event uh, come out of First United Methodist Church Galesburg. Uh, we had 10 pastors there, and two of them, Aaron Totten and uh, Megan Honig, are part of our congregation or have been uh, as they grew up. And it just reminded me that uh, First United Methodist Church uh, is doing many things to change and impact lives in this room, in this community, and throughout the state of Illinois and the world. Those young pastors were nurtured by the youth ministries and children's ministries of this church. Uh, as they got older, they were blessed with financial support by this church and our annual conference that is supported by our giving. And they were blessed in so many ways by this church that have led them to become pastors in adulthood. Those kind of ministries that have impacted their lives and continue to impact many, many lives happen only because of the giving of the people who call this place our church home. Those tithes, gifts, and offerings are what allow us to do the life-changing ministry that happens here and also enables us to send others out to do ministry in Christ's name. So we want to thank all of you who give so faithfully to the ministries of this church. Uh, today there are a few different ways that you are able to give. For those of you who are with us in the room, there are offering plates at the doors, and we would welcome you, uh, leaving your gifts and offerings there while you're with us today. There's also a QR code for those of you who are technologically savvy and interest, interested in using that, uh, that will take you to our electronic giving page in your bulletin. Uh, for those of you who are joining us online, you're welcome to visit our website, firstumcgalesburg.org, where you can use the Give Now tab to give now. And we always welcome those gifts that are sent into the church office or dropped off here. Would you pray with me for our offering to be used by God? Gracious God, however we give this week, we pray that you would receive those gifts and offerings and that you would use them in everything that we give to this church to strengthen your ministries, to transform lives, and to be about the work of Jesus Christ in our church and in our world. All of this we pray in the name of that same Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. All of the earth makes straight a highway, a path for the Lord. Jesus is coming soon. Call back the sinner, wake up the saint. Let every nation shout out your praise. Jesus is coming soon. Like a bride waiting for her groom, we'll be a church ready for you. Every heart longing for our King, we sing, even so come, Lord Jesus. And so come, Lord Jesus, come. There will be justice, all 
will be you, your name forever, faithful and true. Jesus is coming soon. Like a bride waiting for a groom, we'll be a church ready for you. Every heart longing for our King, we sing, even so come, Lord Jesus. As we are together as the church, I have a couple of prayer requests to share with you. Uh, first of all, Phyllis Jern of our congregation uh, lost her son, uh, Jeff, uh, this week. And so we want to invite you to be praying for uh, Phyllis and her sister, um, Mary Bailey, and all of their family in that time of loss. We'd also invite you to be praying for uh, Carol and Dale Ralston of our church family, uh, who both have some uh, significant health concerns, and so we invite you to be praying for both of them at this time. Would you pray with me today? Gracious God, as we gather together in worship today, we do pray that you would come into our midst in a particularly powerful way during this time of worship. We pray, God, that you would come into each of our hearts and lives in this time to remind us of your love, to remind us of the gifts and blessings that you have promised to us, to help us to know your strength, your help, and your blessing. We pray, God, that when we recognize the ways that we have fallen short of your glory and have done things that have wounded you and others and even ourselves, that you would offer us forgiveness and new life through Jesus Christ, our Savior. When we are in pain and dealing with a difficult medical crisis, or walking through times of fear and doubt, or grieving the loss of a loved one, we pray, God, for your mercy 
your help and your strength to be poured out upon us in real and powerful ways. We pray that today, O oh God, for Phyllis as she grieves the loss of her son, a pain that is more difficult than many of us will ever know. We pray for your comfort, your hope, and your strength to be given to her and all of her family. We pray, God, for Dale and Carol, that you will care for them and encourage them and bring them strength as they walk through difficult times in their physical life right now. Care for them and bring them hope, we pray. And God, we pray that you would be with each of us, our loved ones, our family members, and our neighbors whenever we have times of need. We pray, God, that you would be at work in the community, the nation, and the world around us. We ask that you would be with those who go without things that we often take for granted, food, shelter, access to medical care, and so many other things that can cause difficulty and challenge in people's lives. We pray for your mercy to be poured out upon them for your people to be filled with compassion for them and for transformation in our world so that the needs of all your children may be met. We pray, God, for those whose lives have been threatened by storms and natural disasters and by violence and human injustice. We continue to pray, O oh God, for the ongoing situation in Ukraine, that you would protect those who are in the midst of those life-threatening situations, that you would sustain those who are in military service and keep them from evil, and that you would transform the hearts and minds of those who make decisions over life and death war and peace, so that they may seek to lead in the ways that lead towards your kingdom. Almighty God, we pray all of these things today in the strong and mighty name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The late, great, artistic legend Meatloaf, Mr. Loaf to many of us, once declared that he would do anything for love, but he won't do that. He says he'll run right into hell and back. He'll give you up. He'll raise you up. He will help you down. He will get you right out of this God-forsaken town. He'll make it all a little less cold. He will hold you sacred. He'll hold you tight. He can colorize your life if you're so sick of black and white. He can make it all a little less old. He'll make you some magic with his own two hands. He can build an emerald city with some grains of sand. He can give you something you can take home. He says he can and will do anything for love, but he won't do that. There are some suppositions, but what that is, Meatloaf never says for sure in the song. To my knowledge, he never clarified in particular what that was. And now that he's sadly deceased, we may never know exactly what that is. 
It, it may be a lyrical mystery for the ages, but we do know that while Meatloaf will do anything for love, he won't do that. I wonder if perhaps Meatloaf's words might be used to respond to our scripture reading for today, our tough teaching for Mother's Day. Hear these words of scripture from Luke 14. Large crowds were traveling with Jesus and turning to them, he said, if anyone comes to me and does not hate mother and father, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Hate. The, the word used here is hate. And, and there really isn't a lot of wiggle room in the language as if English translators use the word hate and what Jesus really meant was to frown at once in a while. Jesus says hate. To follow him, someone must be willing to hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters. I hate a, a number of things. I, I hate the designated hitter rule in baseball. I, I hate sour cream and when it ends up in my food despite my specific instructions that it not. I, I hate the Lord of the Rings. Books, movies, merchandise, memes, all of it. And, and, and I hate when people assume that being a nerdy geek, I ought to like it. There are a number of things that I might hate, but, but hate my mom and dad? Hate my wife and kids? Hate my sister? I, I, is that even doable for most of us? And Jesus says, hate your loved ones. If you want to follow me. There's a part of me that's tempted to say with meatloaf, Jesus, I would do anything for love of you, but I won't do that. The Bible study group that I'm leading on Wednesday night sent, spent a session on this teaching of Jesus uh, a couple of weeks ago, and I think it's safe to say that we all recoiled from this passage a bit and, and felt uncomfortable with it. People were quick to bring up the Ten Commandments and how they teach us to honor our father and mother. They were quick to say, Jesus teaches us to follow the commandments. How do we honor our mother and father and yet hate them at the same time? Jesus says in the Gospels that the greatest commandments in the Old Testament law are to love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and our neighbor as ourselves. How can we love our neighbor and hate those closest to us? It was even pointed out that Jesus had what appears to be a loving relationship with his own mother, performing his first miracle when she tells him to do it and making sure that she will be cared for while he is literally dying on the cross. Given all of that, how are we to take Jesus' teaching that his followers must hate those who should be closest to them? This morning I want to share a few things with you that I think can help us at least begin to get our minds around this tough teaching of Jesus. First, I want to invite you to remember that Jesus was a preacher. And when he says these words, he's acting as a preacher in front of a crowd. Preachers sometimes use a speech tool called hyperbole, which is grossly overstating things to make a point. If I tell you that I was in the grocery store and I was behind somebody in line who was buying a million things, 
We all know that they didn't literally have a million items on the, the conveyor belt. We just know that they had what felt like a lot, right? If I say that I've told my kids something a billion times, we all know that it's unlikely I've said that a thousand million times, but we do know that it feels like I've told them that thing over and over and over again. If I say I love tacos, we know that I don't have deep romantic feelings for Mexican cuisine that rival my feelings for my wife. It just means that I really enjoy eating them and feel sorry for those who don't. We all use hyperbole, using a, an extreme number or, or word to emphasize a point. And, and in Jesus' time, it was very common for Jewish teachers and preachers to use that kind of phrase in their public teaching. As Jesus was looking at this large crowd of people who were following him, Jesus likely realized that there were some in that crowd, who were just there for the show, hoping that he would perform miracles to entertain and amaze them. There were likely some in the crowd who were there for the free bread and fish that they were hoping that he would continue to give them. There, there were some there he knew who had come just to, to see if he would throw off the Roman oppressors someday soon. He knew that there were many people in that crowd who were not there for reasons that were in keeping with the kingdom of God that, that Jesus had come to bring into being. It's likely then that Jesus wanted to give that crowd a reality check. None of those worldly concerns were his primary concern. He would heal people out of compassion. He would feed hungry people who couldn't get home because his sermon ran too long. He would do miracles to point people towards the kingdom of God. But none of those things were really what he was about. And so Jesus needed that crowd to know that he was about other things. So he speaks to them in the harshest words possible to jar them into hearing him say, Friends, this isn't a party, it isn't a show, it isn't a political campaign. What I'm about is a new work of God, a new kingdom of God that is coming in your midst. And if you're going to be a part of it, it's going to require some sacrifices and some hard work. And so you need to know that coming in. And, and so if you're not willing to, to, to hate those who love you, and even your own life, you need to know you may not be able to follow me. Perhaps Jesus doesn't really mean a deep emotional hate of loved ones. But he uses that word to shock his followers into hearing that message that those who follow him will indeed be called to make sacrifices. What follows in Luke 14 drives that point home. Jesus says that his followers must be willing to take up their cross and follow him. We, we've sort of sanitized crosses over the last 2,000 years. We, we wear cross necklaces, we wear cross earrings, we wear cross t-shirts. We, we hang crosses on our walls. We magnetically stick them to our cars. We put out cross tapestries and, and garden flags. We design cool logos for our church with crosses intertwined in them. For those first hearers of Jesus, though, the cross was literally a device of torturous execution. And there is literally only one time in that culture when someone would take up a cross. When they were carrying the implement of their own execution to the place of their death. To make crucifixion even more horrifying, if you were to be executed that way, you were made to literally drag your own cross outside of the city to the place where you were going to die. We see Jesus doing that himself in the Gospels shortly after he speaks these words. 
When Jesus tells people that to follow him, they will need to take up their cross, he's stressing to them that the way of discipleship that he's teaching is hard and difficult and sacrificial. And so when he says that his followers must hate mother, father, spouse, children, siblings, and even themselves, he's not necessarily calling those people to develop a deep emotional hate of those people. He's not saying that they must emotionally despise their loved ones or or treat them with scorn. Jesus is, though, saying that those who would be his disciples must be willing to devalue their relationship with parents and spouses and children and siblings and to make decisions that will prioritize their faith above all human relationships. And that may look like hate, right? It's not an emotional dislike, but... If they put following Jesus above duty and responsibility to family, it may look like hate or or feel like hate if you're on the receiving end. And and so the call to hate loved ones is is partially overstated hyperbole, and, and it's partially a call to understand that if they follow Jesus, then their faith comes before any other valued thing or relationship. We see that in the lives of the 12 apostles. Jesus was an itinerant preacher and and spent his three years of public ministry wandering throughout the Holy Land, preaching the good news of the kingdom of God everywhere. To be with him, the disciples had given up their homes, their careers, the safety of their hometown, and even close relationships with their families. Sometimes we forget this, but we know that Peter, at least, was married. Because there is a story in the Gospels that talk about Peter's mother-in-law. So we know that he was married, but instead of being at home with his wife during those three years of ministry, enjoying her company, supporting her and building a life with her. He was following Jesus everywhere Jesus went. He was off wandering with Jesus and seeing her sporadically at best with, in a culture without cell phones, social media, email, or even a reliable postal system. When James and John answered Jesus' call to follow him, they were literally abandoning their fisherman father in the boat. They they literally get out of the boat, leave dad holding the nets by himself, and go off to follow Jesus. In order to follow Christ, the twelve abandoned their families and left home. Something that very much would have looked like hate towards those families in a culture where family obligations were seen as essential. So we're here 2,000 years later, and we read in Scripture that Jesus tells us that his followers must hate our mothers and sisters, our spouses and children, our siblings, and even ourselves. Let me say right up front that I don't believe that's a passage of Scripture where strict, literal adherence is called for or helpful. I don't believe that any of us run the risk of losing our eternal salvation if we do not develop severe negative emotional reactions to our closest relations. As parents, we might have a moment where we're tempted to feel that way with our kids, but we don't have to. There is a sense, though, in which we need to stop and truly consider the cost of discipleship. Jesus says that following him means taking up our cross and literally risking execution for our faith if necessary. Jesus says that faith means elevating our love for God and Jesus above even the most important relationships in our lives. Following Jesus means being willing to say, yes, I will go to Jesus, even if it calls us to sacrifice something we want to do. 
or time with people we love, or experiences we value, or things that make it look to others like we might hate ourselves or the people in our lives. It's not that we don't love those people with all of our hearts, but it is that we love Jesus more. And our desire to live as followers of Jesus Christ may call us to prioritize the leadings and callings of God above everything else in our lives even to the point that it may not look to others as if we care about those people and things. The New Testament book of Philippians chapter 2 calls us to have the same mind as Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage, Rather, he made himself nothing by taking on the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. To enact our salvation, Jesus gave up everything to enter into our world as one of us and to suffer, die, and rise again. The first disciples of Jesus gave up homes, jobs, family, security, and nearly everything else to follow Jesus to the point that all of them except John would die martyrs' deaths. Jesus and his first followers gave up a lot for faith. And yet how often in our lives does our faith feel something far less sacrificial. We we show up for church on Sunday, at least we do when it's convenient and when the weather's not too bad and we, we don't feel less than great. We give a little money to the church, but often not so much that we begin to feel a pinch. We pray when we think about it or when we have a need. We may read the Bible if time allows and we're not too busy. We may even serve on a church committee, remember a time when we taught Sunday school for a period or or put in a few volunteer hours here and there. But are any of those things truly sacrificial? Are we giving up anything in our lives that we really miss in order to come to church and follow Jesus? Are we praying and studying scripture in amounts or places that feel sacrificial? Does it really feel like a sacrifice when we serve on a committee? And is our volunteering such a commitment that we really feel that we are pushing ourselves to do it and following Jesus? I believe that today we need to hear Jesus' teaching about hating our loved ones and even ourselves. We need to hear the call to take up the cross and follow Jesus, not because we're necessarily going to be asked to do any of those things literally, but because those teachings of our faith remind us that faith is supposed to challenge us and push us and call us to risk. If our faith does not push us and challenge us and call us to sacrifice, is that really faith like Jesus talked about? We live in America, so the odds are that most of us will never be asked to die for our faith. The likelihood is that that, that most of us will not be called to truly hate a loved one for our faith. However, if we're going to follow Jesus, if we're going to live as Jesus taught, if we are going to make our faith the highest priority in our lives, that may indeed ask us to value our faith above and beyond our loved ones. We may be asked to do something that that requires putting Jesus before those loved ones. We most assuredly will be asked sometime in our lives to put our faith before ourselves. There are things we are called to do to live as Christians. Read the Bible, pray, attend worship, find ways to love and serve others in our communities, stand up for justice in our world. 
And I think that we need to do those things faithfully and regularly, even if it gives us less time for our family or for things that we enjoy. I'm also dedicated to being faithful to God in my finances as as our family is committed to giving at least a tenth of our net income to the work of God through the ministries of this church. And let me just tell you, that feels sacrificial sometimes with two kids in college and one at home. We rarely go without anything that we need, but there are times where we've given up things that we want and there are times right now that that money could come in handy. For me, none of those things are are obligations or requirements or hoops to jump through. For me, they are the call of God upon my life. I have the privilege of being part of the family of God and experiencing God's love and blessing through Jesus Christ. And so I do things with joy because the God who calls me to them has blessed me beyond my ability to understand. But those things do feel like sacrifice. They often look like sacrifice. And to someone who does not fully hear the call of Christ in their own lives, they may even look like I'm doing things that that, that look like hating myself or my loved ones for the cause of Christ. I, I don't hate my parents, my wife, my kids, my sister, or or really anyone. I don't hate myself or or my own life. I think I'm pretty groovy. I've never had to physically lay down my life for my faith. But I have indeed had times where I've had to count the cost of following Jesus as my Lord and Savior. I've taken risks for Jesus. I've given money, time, energy, sweat, my professional life, and many other things for the cause of Christ. I have sacrificed. And even when it doesn't always make sense to other people, even if someone outside of me might say that following Christ looks like I'm doing something harsh towards myself or my loved ones, I follow the call of God. I have done those things and I will do them again. I will not stop answering the call of Jesus Christ and stepping out in faith in God's name. I will do anything for love, but I won't do that. Would you pray with me? Gracious God, we thank you for the great love that you have shown for us in Jesus Christ. That in Jesus, you were willing to leave heaven and enter earth as one of us so that we might see your kingdom of God and experience your love. We thank you for the suffering and death of Jesus that showed us just how great your love is for us. And we thank you for the resurrection that revealed to us that your love can conquer even death itself. We thank you for those promises of our faith and all the ways that we experience them. And we pray, God, that you would help us to come and follow you. Help us to come and walk in the ways of Christ. Help us to come and do what you have called us to do in order to respond to your love and live in your ways. All of this we pray in the strong and mighty name of Jesus Christ, our crucified and risen Savior. Amen. As we remember in this Easter season that we love and live for God because God first loved us and gave God's self to us in Jesus. Would you stand as we sing praise to that God one more time? Only one.
one whose favor I see. to remind you that if you're going to attend the tent meeting worship service next Sunday, be aware of wearing colognes and perfumes and other things that will attract bugs. And, and of course, if you do not have period dress, come dress comfortably for an outside worship service. But today, friends, as we are gathered in this place and prepare to take our leave, may you know the love of God the Father the grace and mercy offered to us through Jesus the Son and the leading and power of God the Holy Spirit. And may we live our lives in the light of God's call upon us as we strive to follow Jesus today, tomorrow, and always. Amen. I wake up in the land of glory with the saints I will tell my story there will be one day that I proclaim when I wake up in the land of glory with the saints I will tell my story there will be one day that I proclaim 